Yeah. All right, well, let's, let's start. Yeah. yeah, let's start. Okay. We don't have uh, anything more. Yeah. So I'm delighted all of you could come and delighted that the panelists can participate in this event. Um, this morning, uh, 12 to 1.30, we heard a very interesting le lecture. Trump and the Republican Party crack up a modern historical perspective uh, by our visitor, uh, who is Geoffrey Capo Service. Uh, and, of course, he's the author of the book Rule and Ruin, the downfall of moderates and the destruction of the Republican Party from Eisenhower to the Tea Party, and now brought up to date with the Trump insurgency as well. So he works and lives in Washington. He works for a moderate Republican organization in Washington uh, and trying to revive moder moderation within the Republican Party. Uh, so we're delighted to have him as a, as a visitor for uh, a couple of days. Uh, next to him is the Honorable Lee Hamilton. Uh, Lee Hamilton, as you know, was the congressman from the 9th District from 1965 to 1999, a very distinguished member of Congress, uh, specializing in foreign affairs and tax policy and other areas as well. Uh, when he left the Congress, he became president and chief operating officer for the Woodrow Wilson Foundation. And also, to our great uh, reward, he joined Indiana University as the founding director of the Center on Congress. He is presently a professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs and in the School of Global and International Studies. Um, and I might say, and I hope Lee will talk about some of these experiences, uh, one of the leading moderates in Congress when he served there, when moderation was somewhat more valued, shall we say, than it is today. And next to him is Professor Leslie Linkowski. Uh, Professor Linkowski has had a very varied experience <laughs> uh, holding many positions. Or not holding. <laughs> no, holding and, and uh, being successful in very many positions before he came to IU. And after he came to IU and left and came back, uh, and uh, notable that regarding the various things that he did, was being president of the Hudson Institute. But he's also done many other things as well, uh, really uh, exemplification of public service and uh, the public intellectual. And uh, he is uh, a professor in the School of Public and Environmental Affairs. And the reason that I wanted to invite both of them uh, to speak, and as well as our guest, is because they have all three had not just academic interest in moderation, uh, but they've been on the front lines. They actually have practical experience about uh, how moderation uh, can be incorporated into American public life and politics, but also the challenges that are faced by trying to deal with moderation in terms of our national political life. You know, uh, the theme of the panel is, is there a role for moderation in America's polarized politics? Well, polarization uh, has gotten all of the play, and moderation has been uh, very much a secondary concern, if a concern at all. But I hope today, through our panel discussion, we can uh, elucidate what possible role moderation might play, what we're missing when moderation is not part of our a national political experience, and if there's uh, if it's worth uh, reinvigorating moderation, how might it be done? So it's a pretty wide-ranging discussion. Uh, I'm delighted that all three of them could join us, and uh, I'd like to simply begin by just asking each of them to reflect on a bit uh, about the theme of our roundtable: Is there a role for moderation in America's polarized politics? So, would you begin with some thoughts you might have about this, uh, about the role of moderation, or? Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, I work for an organization called uh, the Republican Main Street Partnership that was started back in 1997 by uh, Representative Amo Houghton, 
Uh, you, of course, <laughs> you know. Well, that's right. And uh, aim a ho- I think much more highly of you now. Amo <laughs> uh, Houghton was somebody who was uh, the fifth generation of his family to run what was then called Corning Glass, yeah. uh, which is now Corning Incorporated. Um, and he was the CEO there really at the time, and, and thanks in large part to his encouragement that, uh, that the internet comes to us today because he did a lot of, he funded a lot of the long term research. Would actually get the connected cables that underwrite uh, the system that we have now. He was a very forward looking. Very forward looking individual. Um, very uh, interesting guy, too. Uh, of course, the Corning Glass Museum is one of the great wonders that you all must get to if you're ever in that part of the world. Uh, ornamental glass that goes back centuries, and there's nothing really quite like it in the world. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, but Amo, you know, when I asked him about influences, why he was where he was politically, said, you know, I, I was from Corning, New York, which is a relatively small town, and, and the area surrounding it is very heterogeneous, shall we say. Um, and that is to say that there's urban areas, there's rural areas, um, there are colleges and universities, there are factories, there's a wide swath of American culture in this district. Uh, and to some extent, Amo was and is a believer that the members of Congress should represent their districts. And I remember talking to another member of Congress who went to the funeral of Wright Patman, a uh, Texan uh, representative who was from uh, uh, sort of the central area of Texas. And he said, you know, when I went to that district, I understood Wright Patman a lot better because the houses were poor and the farms were poor and the cows looked poor. <laughs> Um, and you understood why those people felt like they had been screwed by the international bankers and the cities and, and were very much into the whole cross of gold rhetoric uh, that had been a staple of populism for lo those many years. Um, so we are a, a very diverse country. We have a lot of uh, different areas, and it's okay that each area has a different opinion about what's right for it. Um, you know, I quoted earlier today the, the speech from Learned Hand, uh, The Spirit of Liberty. And the famous quote, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. But it's also the spirit that tries to understand all men and women and where they come from, uh, whether you agree with them or not. And I think that's something which is somewhat lacking in American life right now. And moderation, I think, is that, not that it stands for nothing. Of course, it stands for principles. It has things that it wants to accomplish. And there's different varieties of moderates. But it wants to understand that it wants to cooperate and it wants to govern ultimately. Uh, and that is a spirit which, as I said, is somewhat lacking in Congress at this moment. Now, there's a structural problem. I, I'm not big on structure. I much more prefer to speak to the experiences of individuals, but structure has its place. And part of the moderate Republican experience during the decades that I wrote about, the 50s, 60s, into the 70s and 80s, was a time when Republicans were in the long wilderness years, when they didn't have control of either house of Congress, and it seemed as though they might never have it again. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of that was that the Democrats actually gave space to the moderate Republicans, because they know these people were uh, good at what they did. You could make deals, you could get things done, and a lot of things in American life don't have real legitimacy unless there's buy-in from both parties. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons that civil rights has prevailed to the extent that it has in this country is because there was great buy-in from most of the Democratic Party and the vast majority of the Republican Party. And the same thing is true of a lot of other areas of American life. So you actually had a situation where there was a degree of comity uh, of the kind that comes when people are not spending millions of dollars to have you lose your job, right? But that is not the situation we have right now. Um, there's only a relative handful of competitive districts in the House right now. And the vast, money, uh, the vast majority of the money that the Democratic Party is going to spend right now is going to be to try to knock off those few members of the Republican Party with whom they have the most in common. So probably the most expensive race in the House is going to be Representative Bob Dold uh, from the Chicago suburbs. And Bob Dold is someone who is a very moderate Republican, uh, who is pro-choice, who actually believes global warming is going on, who's taking steps <coughs> to go against it, who is serious about governing, who wants to actually make deals to make the country better. He is a conservative. Uh, his means of getting to the desired ends are different from those of Democrats. 
But you wouldn't think that the ideological difference is so vast that it would justify spending multiple millions of dollars to remove Bob Dole. But in fact, this is the case around the company. Carlos Corbello, another example of a very conscientious young Hispanic Republican congressman who will probably have the second most expensive re-election race in the country. And the reason that this somewhat distorted uh, dynamic goes on right now is that uh, the House is up for grabs. We live in a very divided republic where a few votes can make a difference in the presidential election, as we saw in 2000, where a handful of votes can make a district and make the difference in a congressional election. And the Democrats have a striking chance at taking back both the Senate and the House right now. And therefore, that means that the people with whom they have most in common are the people whom they have to knock off. Even though the price of this is going to be that this is going to relatively empower the most extreme parts of the Congress. Uh, so the Freedom Caucus will be a numerically larger part of the House Republican Conference assuming that most of the moderates do meet their fate. So it's an unpleasant dynamic that we're locked into right now. I don't really know the answer. One could argue that the answer is the ultimate triumph of one party or the other. Uh, that in fact, maybe we should move to something like a parliamentary system, uh, which in effect is the way the Republicans are choosing to play the game on some level right now. Uh, I don't know if that's the answer either, um, but I do think that uh, it's important to preserve the functioning part of Congress, particularly as all of the things in American life, all things in congressional life, are working against comedy and against cooperation. And let me, from there, just move on to Representative Hamilton. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I'll just make a few comments uh, on your question, Ted. Uh, your statement was very, very good uh, on, the, on the mark. Uh, is there a role for moderation? I think I'd say, yes, indeed, it's the only way forward uh, at the end of the day. The first point I want to make, and this may seem like a little strange one, but you've got to make, uh, we're in a period where everybody's concerned about, and legitimately so, about the dysfunctionality of government, and especially the Congress. You have to make a distinction between power and politics. Our politics is very dysfunctional today and turns most of us off in many ways. On the other hand, it is important to note that there is a lot of power being exercised in government that is not dysfunctional uh, at all, and that is in the bureaucracy. Uh, let me just give you a simple illustration. The Treasury Secretary. The Treasury Secretary has a lot of things on his plate that need to be done regardless of what's happening on Capitol Hill <laughs> or even in the White House. He's got to finance the deficit. Uh, he's got to work with the world trade organizations, uh, the international banks, and all the rest of it. So Jack uh, Lou here is kind of an ultimate technocrat. And uh, you got all this noise about polarization, lack of moderation, and all the rest of it, all of which is true. But there's a vast part of the government that's still operating uh, and trying to deal with the problems that are on the plate. That's a very important thing to keep in mind uh, as you move forward. Now, there are also a lot of problems not being addressed that should be addressed they'll only be addressed if we get the political side of it right. The second thing is that I think the polarization and lack of moderation really is a defining feature of our politics today. Uh, for a politician, they, uh, uh, it seems to me they, they have to become trying to think about a way forward here. Uh, the first point I would make is that politicians have to accept the environment they are in. They cannot create that environment. So what does that mean? That means you've got so many votes in the Republican side, you've got so many votes on the Democratic side, you've got a president who's a Democrat in the White House, that's the political reality. The Republicans control the Congress. Uh, 
Democrats control the White House. It's amazing how many politicians are unwilling to accept that. You've got to deal with the realities that are there. And the president has power. You may not like the president, but he has the power. And the Congress has certain powers. You may not like the way they're handling it, but you've got to deal with it. So I think a very important thing for members is to look at the environment they are in and figure out how to make the system work how to address the problems that we have before. Some of those problems you cannot address in the political environment, and you put them aside. There are some problems that you can address, and you go to work on them, and there are other problems you're not sure, and you set them aside maybe temporarily. Uh, I think members have to be, above all, pragmatic <laughs> in their approach to problem solving. I've sat in on a lot of meetings in the White House, in the Oval Office, and in the Cabinet Room, where we've had discussions, and by and large, under any president, I am impressed by the process that a president goes through before he, always been a he up to this point, makes a decision. They'll have a small group of people, maybe the size of this group. They'll go around the room and they'll ask, what, the, qu the question is always the same, what do I do now? What do I do right now? You can give them a present, all kinds of information about a problem, they already know it, or they have staff that knows it. Uh, you can uh, come up with the most uh, brilliant analysis possible, and it's amazing how many of these solutions are long term. The president's problem is, what do I do right now? And that's the question. So the presidents would go around the room, what do you think, Lee? What do I do right now? What's the American interest? What can we achieve? What can we not achieve? What are the obstacles? What's the political mood of the country on this? What is the American interest? And how do we advance that interest? And one of the things that has impressed me is that those discussions are not as ideological as you might think. They are fact-based. They are often arguments that raise tensions a little bit. Uh, they can be heated at times. I can never remember, however, a time when they turned incivil, uncivil. I cannot remember a time. I can remember differences of opinion arising, that sharp differences and voices would raise, but I can never remember a shout match <laughs> in, in that environment. And uh, I was, I've been impressed by that process. Uh, it happened under Republicans and it happened under Democratic presidents. And uh, I thought uh, I'd come away from a lot of those discussions and I'd say to myself, this is a good process. And obviously not flawless. We screw up now and then. We make some mistakes. But the process uh, always struck me. I believe that moderation can come forward if we let Congress work its will. Now, that sounds very elementary and simple, but it is not. We have had a Democratic leader in the Senate who oftentimes would not bring a bill forward because he wanted to protect the Democratic Caucus. He would not let the Senate work its will. We've had Republican leaders, including the present leaders, who do the same thing. They block legislation coming forward. I believe you should require the Congress to vote on the major issues of the day. Make them vote on. I believe you would find a lot of cross-voting, <laughs> in other words, a lot of Republicans joining Democrats and Democrats voting, uh, joining Republicans. But put them on record, and I think that would have a huge impact on uh, moderation and polarization if you let them do that. Now, that means, among other things, that I oppose the Hastert Rule. The Hastert Rule says, he was the Speaker of the House from Illinois, and a very fine gentleman,
But he followed a rule that said that he was a leader of the Republicans. He said, I'm not going to bring a bill out of the caucus, out of, onto the floor of the House, unless a majority of my Republican caucus supports it. See, that runs counter to what I just said. Let the Congress work its will. So, uh, and uh, Democrats have applied the same rule, incidentally, in times past. So I want the Congress to work its will. Uh, there are a lot of procedural steps we could talk about that would soften. Uh, I won't go into those. They're kind of technical in nature. Uh, one of them uh, I'll just mention, which is an obvious one, much discussed, and that's the question of scheduling. Uh, it's very hard for members of Congress today to get to know one another especially in the House. The Senate's a little better at this. Members don't want to come into Washington till Tuesday. <laughs> they want to leave by Thursday afternoon. So on Wednesday, you'll have 20 committee meetings for you to attend to, committee and subcommittees. But everybody wants to schedule late Tuesday afternoon and uh, Wednesday and uh, be out of there by Thursday noon. You cannot run this country on a two, two or three day schedule in the United States Congress. You cannot do it. Because what you're doing is the, the hardest thing to do in a democracy is to build a consensus behind a solution. That's a process that takes time. You can't force it too much. You have to have a lot of discussion. When I was on the 9-11 Commission, we had five Democrats, we had five Republicans, every one of them identified as a strong partisan. We came out after long deliberations with 67 recommendations unanimously. How did we do it? We talked, and we talked, and we talked. I don't know other, any other way you build a consensus in this country except talking with one another. I can remember driving across the 14th Street Bridge at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> several times saying to myself, we will never get this thing resolved. And Tom Kane, who was a marvelous leader, uh, former governor of New Jersey, would say, Hamilton, you're coming back at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and we're going to start all over. <laughs> And we kept at it. It can be done. I know it can be done. I've seen it done many times. You can build a consensus behind a solution to a problem. But you cannot impose your will. You cannot uh, get it by Thursday afternoon. You have to let the process run. Uh, now, on the optimistic side here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You got to remember, we got a situation as you described, which is awful. We're 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 constipated, if I may use a word from a different area. <laughs> we can't get things done. We can't get things out, uh, and it's very distressing. We have a Congress of the United States that cannot pass a budget. Period. They can and have not been able to since the middle of the 1990s. All they do is pass a continuing resolution, which is an abomination in process. They're drawn not up by members of Congress, but by staff. They're drawn up in secrecy, with no accountability of any kind. They are brought to the floor of the House for one hour of debate, up or down, with no amendments. That is the process by which we now enact the budget of the United States government. It is an unmitigated outrage for the greatest democracy in the world to pass its budget in such a secret, unaccountable fashion. So we have to change that for sure. But the positive side is this. Politics is dynamic. We've got a situation today that we're very discouraged with, but things change. Politics are not always going to be the same. The American electorate is not always going to be uh, the same mood they're in today. Uh, the president's going to change. Events will change. Things will change. 
And you have to have an underlying confidence in the system that it'll work. It's brought us through a civil war. It's brought us through two world wars. It's brought us through waves of immigration. It's brought us through all kinds of vicissitudes and uh, successes. The system can be made to work. It's very hard to make it work, but it can be. And the final point is this. If you've got deadlock in Congress, you've got to let your, your representatives know you don't like it. They've got to begin to respond to that. But for you and me as citizens, our responsibility is the same. We've still got to be trying to be the informed citizen. And we have to insist with our representatives, it is your responsibility to make this government of representative democracy work. Representative democracy is a monumental achievement. It is the one of the greatest achievements in the mind of man, from my perspective. It is a monumental achievement. But nobody ever said it was easy. It's very, very hard to make it work. And members of Congress have to be pragmatic about it. If you're going to solve the problem of the tax code, which is an unholy mess, you're going to have to do it in a bipartisan way. You're going to have to have support from uh, the middle of the Democratic Party, the middle of the Republican Party, and maybe, maybe some will join you on the fringes. I don't know how you get a solution to the major problems we confront that is not bipartisan. The Democrats cannot put forward a tax reform plan and get it through the House, neither can the Republicans. They're going to have to cooperate. And, uh, oh, I got five or six more points. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you buster, huh? <laughs> you see my attitude on this. Thing. You got to hold your representatives accountable for this. They, look, I, one other comment. <laughs> I can go before any group in America, any group, and make myself look good and the Congress look like a bunch of idiots. Politicians are very good at that. Very good at it. But if you're going to change the Congress, they have to change it. They have to change it. I'm tired of people coming around and giving me speeches about we're going to reform the tax code of the United States. And then go back to Washington and do nothing on it. I'm tired of people coming in and saying to me we got to change, we got to have immigration reform. And going back to Washington and for 20, 30 years doing nothing about it. Nothing. I'm tired of hearing people say we're going to have some kind of affordable health care and then doing very little about it. I, I, I've lost a lot of my patience here. You've got to hold these people accountable. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing you broke in. <laughs> I thought we were going to get, we we get to your next 14 points. I thought I'd you better start quick. Do we have a gavel? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today, not only being the company of such fine people, but also because the opportunity to be on this panel enabled me to do something I should long ago have done, which is to read book. Um, now, I'll try and understand why I did long one. I mean, well, it's not the length. The book actually is a chronicle of numerous organizations and friends I know have worked with, in some cases gave grants to, or case of Bruce Chapman, employed. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. At various and sundry points, so it was interesting. I never, I never knew that what I always knew, which was George Gilder's reputation for being, oh, you say absent-minded, I would say scatterbrained, <laughs> um, was more widely understood. Um, so I'm trying to understand why didn't I read this when it came out. I'm sure there are all the usual reasons of busyness and so on, but I suspect the answer probably lies in the fact that, like most people who have worked in the nation's capital, 
I, when a new book comes out, I do what is known as the Washington Read. The Washington <laughs> Read basically means you take the book, you go to the index, and check to see if you are mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> That's academic. <laughs> well, maybe there's more in common then. But uh, I was not mentioned, which I don't... Uh, I'm not a criticism. But I do figure in the, the <coughs> drama that's recounted here, because my first job after earning my PhD, it was my first real paying job, uh, consisted of being the program director of what is known as one of those conservative foundations that engineered the so-called Reagan revolution in public policy. Esquire magazine actually once did a profile of me in the late 70s, referring to me as the treasurer of supply-side <laughs> economics. <laughs> uh, the foundation I worked for was called Smith Richardson Foundation. Those of you who don't know the product that enabled Mr. Richardson to make all that money. It wasn't anything as elegant as glass. <laughs> uh, it was Vicks VapoRub. <laughs> so I presided over hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Vicks VapoRub. <laughs> um, uh, and Mr. Richardson had been in America. First, he was pretty close to William Frawley, a number of people. You mentioned Frawley was the head of Schick, who was, uh, I guess, a John Bircher, right? Um, and so on. And so when I was being interviewed for this job as a recent Harvard PhD, I did, I consulted a variety of friends who knew something about the foundation. And I still remember one of them, a guy who also figured in these events named Paul Weaver, tell me that unless if you take this job, you will never be able to give a grant to the Brookings Institution. <laughs> <laughs> And it gave me pause, but to be perfectly honest, the market for newly minted PhDs wasn't much better then than it is now. <laughs> I needed a job. I was living, as it happened for complex reasons, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and moving to New York City seemed like a step in the right direction. <laughs> um, so I took the job. But what I found out, and as we started working in this world of conservative policy, we found that some of the most interesting people and the people worth supporting were indeed at places like Brookings, at Harvard, uh, at other bastions of progressive Thank liberal you. thinking. <laughs> and so, uh, although I always have to make a good case to the board of directors, but you have to do that anyway, um, I did so. Uh, and I think my colleagues at places like the Elsewhere, uh, did very much the same thing. In other words, what really fueled our efforts, what, 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 if you had to sum up what we did, we moved conservative philanthropy away from supporting any organization with the word freedom or the phrase anti-communism in <laughs> its name and toward funding serious policy scholarship, which persuaded people across both sides of the aisles, even though, and this is the point, it is, from another perspective, it could be seen as part of a conservative takeover of the, and has been seen as such, or at least a neoliberal takeover, of the um, policy apparatus. But I want to really focus briefly on a different area here because in this discussion, particularly its emphasis on the political system, the process, I think we're looking in the wrong place, or at least not in, the, in what is not the only place for solutions. We're here in a room graced by the picture of Alexis de Tocqueville, <laughs> and I know you're all familiar with his work, so I don't want to summarize all at great length. But I want to point out that in his famous chapter on the role of civil or civic institutions, he essentially outlines three functions they serve. One is to take some of the burdens off of 
of, of, of government, so government doesn't grow too large and too powerful. A second is as a kind of school for democracy, where we learn how to run meetings, get information about uh, conditions in our society, and so on. But the third one is that we learn what is often referred to as self-interest, rightly understood. When we work in civic organizations or political organizations with others, we learn how to compromise, how to get along with other people, how to make agreements, how to moderate, to use that word, our own interests by compromising them with other interests uh, so that we could, could make uh, go forward. Um, for many years now, however, those of us in my principal field here at the university, as some of you know, is the study of philanthropy and nonprofits and civil society. For many years now, those of us who focus in these areas have been concerned that Americans of the United States is no longer what Arthur Schlesinger Sr. once called a nation of joiners, that by any number of measures, uh, the uh, likelihood of people to join civic associations has diminished, and the kinds of associations we participate, or the way we participate in organizations is often by writing checks to them, or maybe going online and pressing the button that expresses our opinion of something or other. That kind of face-to-face -face involvement that leads to action, or at least some degree of consensus that Tocqueville describes, and helps produce self-interest rightly understood, is not something that the nonprofit world, that American civil society, I would argue, is as uh, adept at generating as it once was. And this is in part because of a variety of policy choices we have made as well, including policy choices uh, advocated by so-called moderates, people who favor compromise policies. So for example, uh, in Rule and Ruin, we would learn that one of the uh, first uh, significant areas in which um, the moderate Republicans of the Ripon Society and others engaged was to try to replace the military draft during the Vietnam War era with the what was then called the all-volunteer forces. And this was a successful effort, though it also benefited from conservative in, uh, activity inspired by Milton Friedman, carried through by a man named Martin Anderson, and others. Uh, but the uh, same advocates of an all-volunteer military force were opposed to the idea of civilian or national service. I had many debates with my good friend Bruce Chapman over this because uh, one of the things I'm proud to say I participated in was the creation of AmeriCorps back in the 1990s, and then I was privileged to serve as the director of the Corporation for National Community Service. Now, it should be said that AmeriCorps is an entirely voluntary program, which may or may not be a weakness of it. <coughs> you are not drafted to go work for the American Red Cross. Uh, you volunteer. But in the course of that, 75,000 or so people every year find themselves working in civic associations, many of whom would not have been doing that before, participate in this process that Tocqueville described. Yet, for a variety of reasons, including what seems to be um, uh, a contradiction in terms paying people to volunteer, as if we do not pay members of the all-volunteer army. Um, uh, a number of people who would regard themselves as moderates, also a number of people who would regard themselves as conservatives, I should add, 
uh, feel that national service is not something we should be doing. Uh, another interesting example which comes up in the book was an early example of the rope of what moderates advocate, an important one, was what is sometimes called black capitalism, which was an effort really to bring market forces to bear to address the problems of inner city African Americans. This too has gotten a pretty bad name in recent years. It's been critiqued by policy experts of all stripes. Uh, and now, interestingly, a man who is often thought of as a leader of the Tea Party conservative groups in the United States Congress is in his own way trying to revive it. I'm referring to Congressman Paul Ryan, who has been spending a fair amount of his time visiting inner city communities, much as Chuck Percy and others have done. Well, my point is, of course, that, that in this is that what we're dealing with is not so much a, a, a lack of moderate policy options, but a lack of an ethos of moderation brought about not just by the kinds of political process, problems we've seen in an in institutional problem, but in a larger sense of uh, the nature, the changing nature of American society and culture. I've been on the road a lot, so when I wrote, arrived home last night, I found my economist waiting for me. <laughs> uh, and I hope you can see this. The cover story is called The Debasing of American Politics. Now, that's a very interesting word. Uh, debasing is not about how the various policy options in front of us are inferior. To the contrary. Donald Trump has some interesting policy options, even though he's often not very good at explaining them. By the same token, Secretary Clinton, who prides herself on being a policy expert, has got herself in a variety of options, such as her opposition to charter schools, that many people who know this field think are very ill-considered. Uh, but rather, the debasing of politics, at least in the economist view, and I would agree with this, has to do with the words we use and the conduct we uh, display in our political activity. And I think that's been evident in any number of ways. Uh, and yes, largely, but not exclusively by God, through the, the Trump people, but you also see a fair amount of this, I would submit. Democratic side as well. And that that kind of debasement is far more worrisome and far more difficult to deal with, I'm afraid, than the immoderation of certain policy options that might be out there. Let me just finish by saying, so my mentor in all of this, the man I went to Harvard to study with, uh, was somebody who figures a little in here, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And Pat used to, is well known for a kind of axiom. <laughs> he, uh, well, many axioms, but this one is one of them, that to Republicans, it is culture, the, the wisdom of Republic, the great idea of Republicans is that culture ultimately affects politics, of Democrats that the right kind of politics can affect culture, change culture. And I think as we think of the problem of moderation in American politics today, to focus mostly on the, on the policy side, on the institutional side, only picks up a part of the problem and perhaps not the most significant. Well, thank all three of you. They were terrific uh, commentaries on uh, experiences on uh, moderation and possible role in our politics. Let, let, I'm just going to ask one more question of each of them, and then I'm going to turn it over to all of you to see if you have some questions, and they may have some for each other, which would be fine as well, too. And that is uh, just to think a little bit about how you go about forging compromise, bipartisanship, consensus. It's a process, but it doesn't seem to be one 
that we understand very well, or at least we, we find it difficult to bring it into being. And uh, I'm just wondering, it, what, what's, we seem to have this, perhaps it wasn't, but a golden age somewhere in the past where this was more possible, but it seems that increasingly it's less possible to forge uh, a consensus. And I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts about, you know, uh, have we actually moved away from our capacity to form consensus, to build bipartisanship, to develop compromise solutions to our problems, or have, um, or have we not done so? And if so, what keeps us from being able to enact, you know, policies that genuinely have uh, support across uh, a majority of our voters and majority of our parties and politicians? I'm going to try to keep this one quick. Yeah, uh, keep it quick. Because I would That's like good. to get the audience a chance to get involved here. I'm just going to mention that one of the interesting books I read this year was by Robert Toombs called The English and Their History. Uh, the first history of just the English rather than the British mm -hmm. here. And um, one of the things he talks about is the political culture of England and, and really how a synthesis was formed out of bloodshed and strife, but essentially where the Whig position that leaders owed some respect to the will of the governed, as well as the Tory position that those who ruled respect allegiance to the government cannot just change it with violence. These came together to form a culture that was a culture of moderation. Um, moderation was seen as one of the highest of virtues. Uh, compromise was seen as a victory, not, not a defeat. Um, and you heard a lot of pronouncements against enthusiasm and fanaticism and superstition and hypocrisy which were all terms used for the opposite of moderation. And even today, this persists in England, to some extent in Britain as a whole, um, in a dislike for really vituperative, personal, insulting political discourse. Um, and so the culture and the politics both reinforce this idea of moderation together. Um, what we have in America is the culture going in the opposite direction of moderation, in ways we could get into, but essentially, the idea that moderation is boring, that compromise is a defeat, um, and that politics is entertainment. And the highest form of entertainment is when your side wins and triumph over the defeated corpse of your enemy. Um, and what we really need to do is recover the culture that the founding fathers imbibed, which was this English culture, in praise of moderation, in praise of compromise, in praise of agreement, and opposing the things that drive people and nations apart. Um, and I hope that we can learn this in a positive way and move towards that, rather than learning, as we usually do, the hard way. I made two comments, uh, at least. <laughs> uh, one is, when, when I would sit in a, con a conference report, conference committee, where you resolve the final questions in the legislative process, uh, I learned early on not to pay much attention to labels. Um, and I got to the place where I really was not much interested in whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, or whether you're a conservative or a liberal or moderate. I, the question on my mind as I went around the room, and most conference committees would be about this size, was Does this person want to solve the problem? That was the question. And I often found that labels, we, we, we slap labels on everybody. <laughs> and it, it uh, makes the resolution of the problem more difficult. Let me give you a simple example. Again, the 9-11 Commission. One of the members on the Republican side was Ed Meese. I was a Democrat. Ed Meese was the absolute devil incarnate <laughs> for the Democrats. I, when I saw his name on the list, I said to myself, my God, we're headed for deadlock, <laughs> for sure. I could never have been more wrong. Ed Meese turned out to be a very, very valuable member of that commission. He had an expertise in police and 
law enforcement that was unsurpassed. And he wanted to find a solution to the problem. And I came to respect him enormously. Uh, so that's the point. Put labels aside. See if the person wants to work to solve the problem. That's what I was interested in. The second thing is this. I do think, Ted, in response to your observation, there has been a change in the dynamics of our politics. When uh, the great example everybody uses, Tip O'Neill, the great liberal, and Ronald Reagan, the great conservative, I sat in in a lot of meetings with those guys, and obviously there are differences of views, to put it mildly, on a number of issues. But the premise was we got to solve the problem. So Ronald Reagan would make his arguments, and his aides would, and Tip O'Neill would make his arguments. And there was a lot of uh, a lot of noise, but had to solve the problem the best they could <laughs> under the circumstances. And so the whole thrust of the meetings became, didn't, didn't necessarily start, but became what can we agree upon to solve this problem or at least to approach the problem. Uh, now fast forward to today. And I think that premise no longer exists, or at least it does not exist as much as it once did. And now the tendency seems to be, I want to get up, get up and give my ideological speech. I want to blow off some steam. Uh, and then we'll walk out of the room. That's being a little unfair, but uh, you get the point. Uh, and the premise that you've got to solve the problem or we've got to come together to an agreement doesn't exist like it was. We've got to get back to that. And uh, Les, with your emphasis, you're exactly right. You, look, you cannot get an agreement unless you negotiate and compromise. You just cannot do it. Your purpose in compromising and negotiating is not to screw the other fellow. If you've got that frame of mind, you're in trouble. What you want to do is to try to reach an agreement where everybody can walk out of the room and say, I won. And that is very, very hard to do. But in politics, the guy that's sitting over here today and his opposed to you is going to be your ally tomorrow <laughs> on another issue. And so my purpose in these meetings was not to try to screw this guy so that he loses everything and walks out of the room in abject defeat. That I wanted to avoid even with a person with whom I disagreed. And I wanted to be able to find some way that that guy or a gal could walk out of that room and say, well, by golly, I got this. Uh, how you approach these negotiations makes all the difference. And uh, you've got to have that attitude. We've got to solve the problem. You've got to be pragmatic. Uh, everybody has to win a little bit. <laughs> and uh, you don't want to defeat. You don't want, you don't want to destroy your opponent. Give him some running room and let him go back to his caucus, conservative or liberal, and say, by God, Hamilton was all wrong on this, but look what I rammed down his throat. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> if he agreed with me on the overall package, he could go back to that caucus and say anything he wanted to about me. <laughs> you got to reach an agreement. Now, a lot of people don't like deal making. <laughs> Every single line of the Constitution of the United States is a deal. Every single line, a compromise, concession. When I went to high school, we had 130 million people in this country. Today, we got 320. It's a great, big, complicated country. 
So I come out of a hotel in Miami, Florida, I want to read the newspaper, put my 50 cents in, it says the Miami Herald, I draw out the paper, can't read a word of it. It's all in Spanish. And I turn around to the guy and say, where do I get an English language newspaper? He said, we don't have any right here. <laughs> Got to go down the street a quarter of a mile. I go down the street a quarter of a mile, go into a drugstore, big sign. English is spoken here. <laughs> I'm not talking about Caracas. I'm talking about Miami. Big country, extremely diverse country, and getting more so every day. And boy, making that thing work is tough, tough work. Hard work. I ran for office 34 times. Not one time did anybody ask me the question, Hamilton, can you negotiate a deal? They wanted to know my position on abortion and you know, the role of the U.S. in the world and all the rest of it, which is fair enough. Those are good issues and many thousands of more. But what you need is you need politicians that can make a deal. You may not like the name Lyndon Johnson or you may do it, but Lyndon Johnson was a deal maker. <laughs> he really was a deal maker. And the thought on Lyndon Johnson's mind was how do I get your vote? If you wanted a bridge built, by God, he'd get a bridge built for you. If you wanted to go see the Pope, he'd send you to Rome to see the Pope. He, it could be totally irrelevant from what you're dealing with. If he could get your vote, he's going to strike the deal. Now that really turns off some people, really turns them off. Without the country, without it, without deal making, the country would not, would collapse. Let me just say very briefly yep. this, because we do want to get everybody involved here. Yes. The mention of Reagan and Tip O'Neill, which we, I agree we hear commonly, we forget that both of these gentlemen were products of what we who study nonprofits like to call the golden age of fraternity. The country in which they grew up was full of all sorts of clubs, membership groups, fraternal societies, sororal societies. People joined those as a matter of expectation and habit. Uh, and in doing that, they learned how to make deals with others, how to compromise. So I would ask the question, as I have been through my professional career, um, what could we do today? I mean, clearly, that well, I wouldn't say clearly. There are still arguments, but most people would say we no longer live in that kind of a what could we do that might foster it? And what can we do that would be realistic? I would love to make uh, um, uh, 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 a program like AmeriCorps a mandatory program where every young person upon graduating from high school or college would have to spend a year or two, but that is unrealistic and it probably wouldn't work at that scale anyway. So are there other things we can do? Well, I'll offer one example I tried unsuccessfully uh, to do when I was in the Bush administration, George W. Bush administration. Um, today, as those of you know, many of you know, if you were to make a gift to a charity and you fell in certain tax brackets, <coughs> we allow you to deduct the amount of your gift. If you were to volunteer for an equal amount of your, a time equal to the amount of money you might donate, you can't deduct it. We allow, we encourage people to give money, but not to give time. Notwithstanding, always talking about time and money are interchangeable. So, since uh, in his 2002 State of the Union message, contrary to those who say President Bush only urged Americans to go shopping. He ended the State of the Union, which is the one that begins with the axis of evil. It ends with a call on all Americans to volunteer, or as he put it, to fight evil by doing good. <laughs>
And this was my program. So we tried, we designed essentially a tax credit for volunteering. So within certain parameters, you could get a credit against your income tax if you could demonstrate, and there, there, were, there are complications of verification and so on, but there are complications like that with donations of money too. Uh, you demonstrate that you had volunteered. I don't think it even got to, I mean, I got it through my handlers at the White House, <laughs> but I they got the first base with <laughs> the Internal Revenue Service. And I don't know what would have happened if they moved it into Congress, right? <laughs> Next thing you know, it would have been amended, so the definition of volunteering probably includes all sorts of things, you know, that are only loosely related to what we think of as volunteering. But <coughs> would that sort of thing work? I don't know. But I do think we need to be creative in thinking about ways, whether for younger people, older people. The other, another thing we did, which we, we, I mean, John Kenneth Galbraith said the first step to dealing with the problem is measuring it. Um, and so in 2002, I got the United States Census Bureau to do the nation's first official study of volunteering. And it has now come out every year since. There's lots of information there that we could use if we wanted to use lots of, and even more of a freight of platform on which we could probably get more information. Uh, how much of that we're doing, I don't know. But uh, those are the things we have to think about if we really want to create the cultural fabric. Now there are other elements of culture, another unrealistic idea. We've heard a lot about, about Al Gore recently. I want to raise wage a campaign to bring back Tipper Gore, who famously campaigned against the trends in uh, rap music and so on. I don't even think, I think it was even pre-rap music. Uh, <laughs> some rap music. <laughs> some rap music. But it was, you know, I mean, the, the state of television, movies, and so on, I don't have to comment on. That. But again, I don't know what we can much do about that uh, in a legal system that values, as it should, freedom of expression, um, which leads itself to a certain sort of license. Great. All right. Um, so, yes. <laughs> yes, I have a question. Um, uh, I would like to know from each of your perspectives. In your view, what do you identify as the key inflection point? from where we had this turn from having compromise and moderation to when we no longer. So for example, you've, you've given the discussion that still with Reagan and O'Neill, they still had this. When, in each of your view, when did the turning point essentially happen where this ethos, this cultural ethos is gone of, of more moderation and working together and compromise? I'm just curious from each of your perspectives how you I, 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 would, I, would, I would put it at Newt Gingrich's elevation to the Speaker of the House following the 1994 elections. Um, because Gingrich really campaigned against the House as an institution. Um, and I think by so doing, he discouraged compromise. Um, he made members know that they would get committee chairmanships and things like that based on their ideological fealty to what he wanted them to do, uh, as opposed to their own consciences. Um, he unleashed money. Uh, that would enforce these kind of divisions. And really it was a scorched earth kind of triumph. Uh, what year was this? Following the 94, 94. 94 congressional elections. Um, I, I would put it there. I'm not much on inflection points. <laughs> uh, it depends on who you ask. That's why I was asking for perspectives. Because yeah. <laughs> I want to see how each of my, you My view it. is this has evolved over decades. There are events, and I think he's put his finger on one of them, that are important events. If you ask a lot of Republicans what triggered all of this, what was the inflection point, they'd say the election in the 8th Congressional District of Indiana, <laughs> Frank McCloskey, uh, yes. uh, uh, who was that? Yeah, Frank, uh, no, no. Uh, 
whoever was involved. Anyway, you had the election, and the Democrat won by three votes or four votes. Uh, well, it had a big dispute over it and counting the votes, so the House of Representatives, controlled by the Democrats, appointed a committee, two Democrats and one Republican, to look into it. But it didn't take a genius to figure out how they were going to do it. <laughs> so they voted two to one to screw the Republicans. And uh, a lot of Republicans point to that and say that started. Well, it was what a big deal. What year was that? Ballpark. Oh, gosh. In the 80s, was it? Yeah, 80. Uh, yeah, I just didn't know. 82? I can't remember. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't remember precisely. But in any event, there have been a lot of events along the way when uh, the Republicans thought they were screwed and the Democrats would think they were screwed. Uh, so it's just evolved over time. And uh, Les's point and yours about culture and all is very, very important. Uh, so I, I don't really put my finger on one thing. But surely in history, like, the thing point. is, in history, there have got to be, all throughout history, there have got to be times yeah. when a given party whatever thought they were being screwed or not. So yeah. what is different this time, why it led during this period, that are, I guess the term you were using, cultural well, people's change. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, and that's why sometimes it does take a trigger. The intensity event. of American politics has really ratcheted up so that Voters are more sophisticated. There's a huge amount of money in the system. Uh, media is much more aggressive than they used to be. Uh, you know, we Americans are very competitive, and we always ratchet up the competition. And that's what's happened in many ways. So that's created an environment that makes it very difficult for the politician to work in. The McCloskey election was 1984. 84. 84. Thank you. Well, we do. Google, Google has ruined sports trivia and. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I mean, the, the inflection point of the phenomena I was discussing, we have a pretty good fix on. And it's mostly, I mean, most, it, it occurs when in the late 60s or early 70s. I mean, Robert Putnam and many others have documented the beginnings of a decline in association really with the baby boomers coming of age, you might say. And of course, while Newt Gingrich is a bit on outside the baby, it's not much, and in some ways, you know, the Newt Gingrich is kind of um, an, uh, an older baby boomer, you might say. <laughs> um, and you know, was, less, if I may interrupt you, there really is, if you want in personal terms, look at Newt Gingrich versus Robert Michael. As the leader of the That's Republicans. Right. That really personalizes it. Newt is much more confrontational, right. much more aggressive, much more combative. Bob Michael, Bob Michael was the Republican leader from Illinois, and he was a very nice guy. He and Tim played golf every weekend, <laughs> and uh, everybody liked him. He was very cooperative, but he was a strong partisan. He had, there was no question about it. But the personality differences between Bob Michael and Newt, excuse me, Newt yeah. Newt. Well, I'm just going to finish real quick. We don't know. I mean, Putnam himself and others aren't sure what happens in the 60s. I mean, there are a lot of different things going on in American society then. What leads to this beginning of the end of associational? Putnam's own explanation, which has a certain plausibility to it, is television. Television became much more uh, uh, widespread during this period. People then would spend their time in watching television, a more or less solitary activity, even if you're doing it in a group of people. Uh, and it's gone from there. One of the things that always upsets my wife when we go out to dinner is seeing at, say, the next table over a couple, usually a young couple, having dinner but not talking to each other, <laughs> instead <laughs> working their cell phones, right? And uh, that all begins in, the, in some ways in the, six, in 
So it's, the, it's that period of time that this decline from in the social, social capital. membership. I mean, we call this social capital. And, uh, that's when we start to see it. Thank you. Good. Okay, yes. Yeah, I, I'm an economist, so I, when I think of uh, forces that change things, I think of incentives and organizations and so forth. And uh, What seems to have happened is changes in the behavior of voters, selecting different kinds of uh, politicians, and also the behavior of politicians. And I'm just wondering if, if uh, you might think there are structural forces, changes in the parties, changes in the rules uh, that might have led to this. Somebody mentioned the Hastert rule. For example, uh, things like this to economists could potentially have uh, big impacts, and maybe they, they're cumulative. Maybe there's a number of things. But curious uh, if, if any of you have any thoughts. I, I'd recommend actually to everybody an article that came out in the Atlantic a few months ago by Jonathan Rauch, mm -hmm. called "How Politics Went Insane." Yeah. yeah. Um, and his argument essentially is that it's been a structural process, an accretive process whereby um, the establishment of both parties has lost control over the individual members. Uh, and the individual members are more or less acting as individuals rather than members of parties at this point. And they're beyond party discipline, and they're beyond incentives. So I don't know if Lyndon Johnson was brought back to do his work <laughs> in the current atmosphere, that he had anything like the results that he had back in his day, because he would have much less to offer or threaten his members with. Um, and alongside this, has grown up, uh, we're talk talking about attitudes, this is the second point of the Rauch articles, uh, what he calls politophobia, <laughs> an attitude on the part of the public that all of this, you know, political arguments are really just froth. There's simple, obvious, easy answers to all of our problems, and the only reason that politicians don't do them is that they're corrupt or too in love with the argumentative process. And this is cynicism writ large, and it extends to maybe 40% of the population by some estimates. And so this also is a different structural situation. You can appeal less to that kind of a population than you could back in the day. Can I tell you one other thing? I mean, there are a lot of different incentive-based explanations, the changes in the political party system and so on. But I wanted to mention one that I know my friend Lee has been involved with, and we can also document this. Uh, when I was a sixth grader in a town in Connecticut, I took civics. It was required in most schools. Roughly about that time, there was also usually a problems of democracy course or something like that that was required of students in high school. Uh, however, especially in the wake of a nation at risk, and even more so through the 90s and no child left behind, the incentives in schools were essentially teach reading, mathematics, more recently STEM subjects. And so the time, I was just talking to our mutual friend uh, Mike Sample today at lunch, and it was he or maybe Valerie who reported to me that surveys of teachers show that they spend about 18 minutes a week teaching anything that might be called civic. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and again, even then, I, I once did a speech that didn't endear me to political scientists in which I laid the blame for this in part at the feet of political scientists and political economists. <laughs> Why? As you, we all know, if you take an introductory political science course in college, one of the first things you will be told is your vote really won't make a difference. I actually, when I was talking as a public servant, had a young person in a speech in Minnesota. And I was urging people, that young people, to be engaged. I said, why? Doesn't the 2000 election show that our vote really doesn't matter? <laughs> well, when you're in public life, as I think Lee probably knows, it's amazing how many obscure facts can come out of your head <laughs> when you're confronted with questions. And of course, while we all focus on Florida in the 2000 there are actually seven states, of which Minnesota was one, where the margin between Bush and Gore was a thousand or two. So if you were a Minnesota voter and say my vote didn't matter because of the Supreme Court, well, a few thousand more voters had come out one way or the other, there wouldn't have been a Supreme Court decision. Well, in my very cynical way, <laughs> and you're an economist, the answer is money. 
<laughs> Government has become very, very big. Budgets of every government, local, state, national, have just gone way up. And when you've got that much money sloshing around in the system, people are going to go after it. I used to ask myself the question, why would the CEO of a Fortune 500 country, company come visit Lee Hamilton? Now, this guy's an important guy. He creates a lot of jobs. He's got tens of thousands of people working for him. He's a very busy, important guy. And he's spending all day long walking around the Rayburn building <laughs> looking for members of Congress. Why is he doing it? He's doing it because he wants a change in the tax code that will benefit him not him personally, but his enterprise. Same thing can be said of labor leaders. They do the same thing. But beyond that, it can be said about almost everybody in American life. My guess is that everybody in this room belongs to an organization that's seeking money from the federal government somewhere. Let's take academia. This will make you nervous, <laughs> I'm already quivering over here. Yeah. <laughs> About 70% of the money for research, this is a rough figure, please, for research in academia today comes from the federal government. If you are a professor and you want to get money for a project, you look at what the federal government has available. Federal government, but incidentally, I'm beginning to worry a little bit here about academic freedom <laughs> because the project is tilted to satisfy the government and their demands. But the incentive to get that uh, the the research is money. Now it's also private money. Campaign for now, you want to get look. If I got a bill pending before the subcommittee of the Ways and Means Committee on banking regulation, the banks of America, particularly the big ones, are all over Capitol Hill. And they, you know, we've got 20,000 lobbyists there. And boy, they are sophisticated. They know exactly what's happening in that subcommittee. They've got language to hand to the member to introduce that will benefit them. And then they'll make a big campaign contribution. Now, all of this has really ratcheted up in the last 20 years. And I am getting very worried about the influence of money in the system. The conservatives, when they talk about the uh, role of government and government getting too big are exactly right. I mean, I'm a Democrat. I'm getting worried about it. Just because they control so doggone much money. But it's not all government money. It's a lot of private money, too. Thank you. Well, let me come. I want to add one thing, if I Thank could. You. That's a big help. Okay. Yeah. About what's changed. Uh, and just make one um, slight point, and that is that it's part of it, too, is the expansion of the policy agenda. Yep. What's, what's happened is that we used to fight over pretty much, and have we done it throughout our history, the, the size and proper scope of the government, of government generally, and especially of the national government. But what, what's happened in, since World War II, and especially since the 60s, has been the added on not just of uh, racial issues and civil rights, but even in some ways more consequentially of the social issues. Because the so social issues are more difficult to compromise on. They make their emotive for people. There's a lot of kind of, you know, emotions that are in them that make it extremely difficult to compromise on, on many of them. 
And what happened was that the other things that we've always, you know, had disagreements about didn't go away. But on top of that, we had this new expanded, you know, um, policy agenda. And now there's a lot more things to fight about. You know, I mean, when you think about the role of the national government, what area is it not involved in? You know, it's easy to pick up. You, you can't hardly find anything. Well, every time that the national government becomes more involved in some area, that opens up another, you know, dimension of conflict that's possible. And so I think especially it's been the expansion, especially in terms of these emotive social issues, that has made it more difficult for, um, for uh, politicians, parties, interest groups even, to compromise and to reach bipartisan solutions uh, and, and actually to negotiate on. They're, they're very personal, they're very emotive, uh, and they often don't, they're not easily, you, you feel like you're giving up something, you know, when you have to compromise on them in a way that maybe not is involved when you're simply talking about another dollar for this government program or that government program. Those things didn't go away. But then you added on top of that, you know, the social issues, uh, and I think it just complicated the uh, policy agenda and made it more and more likely that there's going to be more and more conflict. Anyway, that was just adding my two cents worth. But let, let, let me have one more question. Yes, and you've been raising your hand. Please. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to ask about the role of moderation with respect to this election and the future of uh, the Republican Party, sort of touching on your talk earlier today. Um, and if there was one takeaway that I had from your talk, it is that you know the ideas and influences uh, of the previous times continue to impact the, this party or just politics in general. Goldwater's ideas or Buckley's ideas sort of still influencing the, the party. So in that respect, it could be hypothesized that you know the Trump um, type of uh, impulses currently aren't necessarily going to go away, or the Tea Party uh, impulses aren't going to go away. Trump may lose, but Trumpism is here to stay, might be one hypothesis. On the other hand, you know, some people say that demographics are just going to force the Republican Party to moderate, that, so that might be one influence toward the moderation direction, um, because there just isn't enough white cultural resentment to go around. Um, but then again, that's of course what we said at the end of the last election, and here we are now. So what do you think of that analysis in terms of can the demographics lead toward greater moderation or um, you know, are, are some of these influences, the Trumpist influences, just here to stay? Um, and not just you, sorry, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, sure. I mean, these things often do go in cycles, right? So the 1930s was an era of great conflict in American life, uh, and yet it was succeeded by the era of consensus in the 1950s. And again, the 60s was another great era of conflict, and yet, by some measures, uh, the 90s were an era of coming together. So it's possible you know, we will have this behind us, but it's also a matter of taking action against the grievances that are revealed by the conflicts. And I think right now, you know, you can't simply, if you're a Republican, say, well, okay, Trump lost the election, assuming he does. Let's just go back to our same old free trade policies and agree with the Democrats. That's what's going to happen. It's clear now that you know there are quite a number of people who lose out from these elections, even if overall the country becomes more prosperous. And, and what do you do about that? Um, and I think you know the extent to which moderation will be recovered in the Republican Party. Okay, to what extent must we, not should we, but must we reckon with the messages that the electors are sending us? Uh, to what extent must we change our policies? to be more in line with what's politically possible, which is to say moderate. Uh, I think parties rarely change of their own volition. I think it's usually a situation that they feel that they're forced into uh, by the realities that they confront. Uh, politicians usually are among the greatest of realists, which is why it's strange that there have been so many fantasists lately in <laughs> politics, but maybe that is a phenomenon that we're going to see passing in the future. Please. One of the... Um books I read uh, recently, which I commend to all of you who have not read it yet, which really takes a very interesting look at the so-called disaffected, less educated white voter, is by a man named J.D. Vance called Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, 
Vance grew up in it, that kind of environment. Managed to get out of it with a lot of help from the U.S. Marines and eventually went on to get degrees from Ohio State and Yale Law School. He writes frequently now and makes it quite clear that he feels that Donald Trump is appealing to this voter but not really understanding. Um, and that there will still be, in the wake of his defeat, a group of people not small, who feel pretty marginalized and indeed snubbed by one or another type of elite group <clears throat> in society. And so I think the challenge, as I read this kind of information, another just heard recently about evangelicals, and one of the puzzles of this election is why is the evangelical vote still holding there behind Donald Trump, a man who, to put it mildly, you know, you wouldn't think has the values that evangelicals profess. And according to Alan Cooperman of the Pew Research Institute on Religion, there's a great overlap between this population of disaffected and of evangelicals, and it's the disaffection that they're voting, not, I mean, they understand that Trump is not exactly a religious man, but uh, nonetheless that he's appealing to this disaffection, what's driving that. So then the question becomes, what does one do about this kind of disaffection? And there are probably any number of things, I don't think there's a single a silver bullet here. Um, clearly, employment policies probably are going to play a role in so far, I mean, as we have been, you know, uh, growing areas which, where people with good educations will prosper and those with not so good educations won't. Obviously, getting better educations would be another thing um, that could be done. And then there are other sorts of policies. I was, you know, here at IU, something I applaud greatly. We've just started a program this year in which faculty, like uh, and I have done so, have been asked to mentor young people who are the first in their family to attend college. Now, we don't fully appreciate <clears throat> what a jump it is from this world of the disaffected to the world of IU. There's very little in terms of resources that these young people will have, and yet they wouldn't have gotten here if they didn't meet the criteria for admission. So they obviously have promised. The question is, can you realize that promise? We've done this with African American and to some degree Hispanic minorities. Should we also be doing it for other groups? So there are a variety of things like that, but I think what the Trump campaign has really revealed or should reveal to all of us is this kind of group that is not small and feels itself cut off from the American dream. I, I second the J.D. Vance book recommendation, also uh, Robert Putnam's book last year, Our Kids, which is about, in large part about his hometown in Ohio, right. Right? And, and the really widening of the gap of opportunity between the classes that he's seen in his own town. I'm not sure a Democrat should have the last question. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be the winner, so go ahead. I'm not running for anything. <laughs> I think the Republican Party has come through a very, very difficult year. And uh, Trump has been a huge problem for them, no doubt about it. Uh, I don't envy their problems. I'm assuming that Hillary Clinton wins, Trump loses, that seems to be the direction of things. And then the Republican Party faces the question, how do we deal with the 30 million or 35 percent of the people that support Trump, or 40 percent, whatever it is, and uh, what direction do we go? Trump has laid out a direction that is very, very different from the traditional Republican positions on a variety of issues. 
My personal hope is that the Republican Party will revert to center right and be a very strong voice in this country. I do not favor a weak Republican Party. I favor a strong Republican Party. I favor a strong Democratic Party because I think the best policy is made when there is when there are two strong parties. And so uh, I want to see the Republican Party revert, if you would, to its traditional center-right policies, which I think that voice is very badly needed in the country. Uh, and I, I wish them well in that uh, effort. I do not favor a weak Republican Party. But that's, but that's your hope. What about your expectation? Well, I think it's one step towards uh, moderation in our politics and an appreciation. These people that the Republican Party ignored for a long time, that Trump has captured, uh, are not going to go away, as you've made very clear. They're, they're going to be a factor. And uh, if Hillary is the president, then she's going to have to deal with it in some way just can't ignore those people. Incidentally, this is a great lesson in representative democracy. You cannot ignore a large group of people. People at the top in this country, most people uh, have done very well, but the ordinary American wages are less today than they were in the 1980s for ordinary Americans. You can't do that without pissing off, well, excuse me, without picking <laughs> off a lot of people. And so the Republicans are going to have to deal with it, but not just the Republicans, the Democrats are going to have to deal with it too. But I want to see a strong Republican Party. On that optimistic note, <laughs> let's thank our guests for some terrific comments. <laughs>